Okay, thank you, thank you all. Welcome back. And uh, we are going to hear now a presentation regarding the WIF toolkit or toolbox. Um, this uh, will be done by myself, uh, um, Mateusz uh, from Arthur, uh, Rui from uh, University of Nova Lisboa, and Orpheus from uh, ThinkCode. Uh, it's uh, about the technical tools that have been developed in WIF that uh, do a lot of uh, stuff actually. Uh, allow you to mix content and present it, um, generate 3D content and uh, manage it, uh, annotate content and uh, 3D content, and also uh, enrich metadata and ingest the European. So I will start uh, with, uh, with uh, experience, so we call it with X. Starting, start by saying that my colleague Alex actually should have been here and not me doing the presentation, but uh, it was another reason he cannot be here today. He became a father, so uh, all the all the congratulations goes to him for the presentation of the work. So not me, I was just we just kind of let's say supporting him in other stuff. So okay, what is now this with experience? So the main idea is to enable a documentation, a holistic documentation of cultural uh, heritage from these communities. So in a way, this is, uh, uh, this is a tool to open up collections and make them available in new ways. To, it's a web-based tool that can be accessed and uh, uh, used uh, via mobile devices, but also on, on the desktop. So all the, all the things, basically, representations and uh, uh, visualizations it creates are accessible also on the mobile, which is important because many people are mobile first. Uh, it uh, links content together and creates unique, if you want, compositions of content where people, users, can add their own commentary or uh, add their own thoughts about it. So it enables these different views on a specific, let's say, topic, uh, user-generated views. You can use your own content, own co uh, photos and photographs, but also you can uh, use content that is uh, available in Europeana or uh, as uh, um, CC0 by attribution and so on. Uh, it provides many templates for uh, visualizing all these uh, new forms of interaction and actually doesn't require any, any uh, technical know-how for doing that. What are the main steps here? And these are the main three steps that I'm going to show to, to present later on. It's basically, uh, if you want to see this in a workflow, uh, it is collect content and upload and uh, make the content available, then create, if you want, add new descriptions and curate this content in a specific manner or in a specific order, uh, and of course then publish and share. Well, uh, if you, uh, you can collect, there are many ways to kind of, let's say, collect and, uh, collect and upload content. I would like to stress this European uh, uh, Collect plugin that we have developed, that basically allows you to go to any, any item on Europeana, and uh, when you install this plugin, you can basically import this plugin, this, this content, this item, uh, into your, into WebEx. Uh, where that's uh, a very simple way to do that, and now we're developing also an additional way, where you actually, if you're a user on Europeana, you can create your galleries, and as long as they're public, you can import all these galleries automatically into your uh, WIFX tool. And you can upload using a simple form on photos, uh, not only photos, but a, a, essentially any kind of document, videos, docu uh, audio files and, uh, and documents. Uh, once you do this, basically you can create something we call scrapbooks, so in a way kind of uh, a, a, a container to work on, on a story. And uh, that's, uh, that's the basis for your, for your uh, uh, your uh, exhibition. Uh, in these uh, scrapbooks, you can uh, decide uh, which content goes where. You know, this is uh, one one important as uh, aspect here of this uh, uh, tool is basically that it is uh, allows you a one type of content to be in many scrapbooks, so you can reuse content very easily in different in different uh, um, contexts. Uh, it's uh, you can. Uh, um, 
I have a variety of uh, analysis and indexing mechanisms, so you can search on top of all the content that you've imported based on metadata, based on uh, features that we extract automatically, uh, based on, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technical char characteristics, and you can filter and, and facet uh, uh, this uh, content. You can use the content automatically, basically, in your, uh, in your scrapbooks, so that you can surface content that is uh, uh, in your collections and, in a way, put it uh, in, a, in a temporary container <coughs> so that you can work on that uh, 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 directly or dynamically, if you want, create these galleries as long this content appears in a search and it's something about, let's say, Castellers, it will appear automatically in a gallery. Um, there are ways to, to uh, add context to it, so in a way adding text, explaining and gluing one item with the other, so in a way telling a story from, uh, from uh, one item to the other, so making the, um, if you want, uh, a transfer and adding this context. You can, of course, drag and drop elements and kind of, let's say, arrange the order. And at the end, what you actually do, you select a visualization with a, a a number of them, so in a way uh, you can select from a simple feed uh, to a blog post, to a gallery, to a slideshow, to a, a specific, let's say, uh, other visualizations we have developed, and then uh, show, showcase this content. There is a link that is available uh, at the end that you can either uh, share or uh, use on, uh, on, on uh, social media if you want or share with your friends. You can share this link privately. You can make it uh, publicly available on this with experience tool. But also you can take any of these visualizations and any of these stories that you created and put it uh, on, on your blog or on a website using an embed or, or a JSON code. So that's in short the uh, uh, with experience tool and you can of course try the tool yourself. So. Uh, it is available, uh, you can l l look uh, either to the WIF Culture website where you will find the link to the tool or uh, use this uh, subdomain here, experience.wifculture.eu. That was it from my side and uh, I, we can take questions now if you have. Um, and yes, please. Uh, it is uh, the system creates. Uh, if you want to embed it, uh, the system creates you an embed code that you basically copy paste from uh, from what you see basically to your own website, and then it renders this block inside your own website. This is the uh, most uh, let's say simple way. There are uh, also other ways using basically more programmatic approaches. This JSON, but uh, the simplest simplest one is uh, using this embed code. Other questions. We can also take questions at the end, so I'm happy to uh, move on with uh, in the next presentation and, uh, Ar and uh, by Arthur and Matteo is going to present us the work that they did in 3D asset management and 3D viewer. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as said, the Arctur's uh, task within this work package was to develop a 3D asset manager um, that we've called Weaver 3D Asset Manager. Um, I will repeat this uh, Weave word today a thousand times. Well, well the main idea here was um, the challenge was 3D models. Um, those of you who work with 3D models know that uh, one high quality 3D model could be um, two giga, uh, gigabytes uh, large, and this presents a challenge uh, nowadays on uh, already on uh, desktop computers, uh, even more on mobile phones and so on. So how do we view something that is that big without having uh, a software and without having a hardware that would support that? Um, and uh, of course, without um, 
without the ability to view such 3D models, uh, the challenge is uh, how do people even uh, see what we have created? How do we even uh, communicate it to the wider audiences? Um, so uh, this is one of the this was one of the challenges, the needs, and the purposes um, bef before we started creating a viewer 3D asset manager. So uh, we wanted to create a place where we could uh, safely host large 3D models of cultural heritage. Here the emphasis is on large um, and of course on hosting because we know that many of the platforms um, are not uh, enabling hosting of 3D models. You can only also the case of Europeana, uh, of course you can uh, showcase it there but not to host it. Um, and then the second challenge or the second need was uh, to, to have a function to view these uh, large 3D models. Um, and here, as I said uh, previously, uh, the challenge is how to view them fast and without a special uh, software. Um, if you have the right software, of course, it's easy to, to open such files, but if the majority of users don't have such a software. Um, and then we also wanted, wanted to add additional functionalities. So it's not just about viewing a 3D model, it's also interacting with a 3D model. Um, there are basic tools like uh, rotating, zoom in, zoom out, uh, and so on, but we also wanted to add additional functions, such as uh, let's say that we want to measure the distance within a 3D model or that we want to measure a surface of a roof uh, within a 3D model. So these are some simple tools that um, uh, are now enabled and that we, want to enable, we wanted to enable uh, to a common user, not just a uh, professional uh, 3D specialist. Uh, and of course the fourth was uh, an easy integration of content with Europeana. Um, so to answer to these challenges, um, of course the first one is uh, all the content that is now part of the Weaver 3D uh, Asset Manager is hosted at uh, Arctur's uh, data center in Slovenia um, that has 99.99 uh, uptime um, and um, this is uh, at least now within the project and, and for the agreed period um, a guaranteed uh, place of, of hosting. Um, second, so how do we uh, present, how do we enable users to view large 3D models? Uh, what we've here developed is something that is called progressive loading, which means that um, once the image of a 3D model appears in front of you, uh, it appears from, from afar. Um, and at this moment, the image uh, is, is not loaded fully, so you only see um, the, the main, uh, the, the shapes, the, and, and the very basic uh, textures. Once you zoom in, actually the details start loading. This is how we avoid that uh, all the data is lo loaded at once, so only once you're moving around the image is loading. It creates maybe a strange feeling at the beginning because you see that the image is changing in front of you because it's getting better and better. But this is how we avoid this initial waiting, which is from the user perspective uh, the main, um, I think, the reason why someone would abandon this this tool because it would just load too long. Um, so this is this progressive loading, and of course we are still developing um, it so that it. Uh, it will be faster and faster, and of course that the image is, is better and better. Um, so this, then the third, uh, the third task that we had was, so this integration of tools within the viewer. So we've integrated at the moment uh, measuring of distances within the 3D model. So these are uh, distance, distances within a 3D uh, space. Then we have also measuring of the height, which measures basically the, uh, the height difference within the 3D model between two different points. Um, then we uh, enable the measuring of surfaces, um, and again, surfaces within a three-dimensional space. Um, what we haven't, uh, we also enabled measuring of angles, 
uh, let's say that you want to measure the angle of a roof uh, on, a, on a building. And this is now simple and easy to done. Um, what remains for future projects is measuring of volumes because of just mathematically it's much harder to measure volume um, within a 3D model than, than uh, a distance or a surface. And then the third, uh, the fourth uh, part, uh, the disintegration with the Robana, um, what we uh, created at the moment is um, so this, this uh, link between a Weaver 3D Asset Manager uh, where uh, an XML file is created and then uh, this XML file goes to an aggregator to Valentina, to Photo Consortium and is later further on um, aggregated to, to Europa <coughs> um, and maybe now it's time to show you some of the images ah. um, just before, uh, at the moment we have more than 200 assets uh, uploaded that are within 11 categories, uh, spanning across seven time periods. And of course, through time, the categories will be changing, adding, and of course, time periods will be changing um, and being added. Now maybe to show you. So you see, this is basically how, how it is. At the beginning, it loads, loads very fast. Um, a person can, using a mouse or a tab, uh, turn around, uh, zoom in, zoom out, uh, make a full screen uh, view of a, of a, of a model uh, and here you see as uh, we're getting closer the image is changing and is loading uh, more and more details and of course the, the details depend also on how the model is prepared, how, how detailed it is um, and uh, yeah, it has functions, as I said, as measuring the distance, measuring the, uh, the height. Um, the accuracy of these measurements um, is, depends on two factors. One is how accurate a person is in selecting a point. So how, how accurate you are actually in, in selecting a certain location that you want to measure. And the second is on the accuracy of the model itself. Um, so the, when, we talk, when we talk about the accuracy of the model itself, uh, it's how accurate, um, how accurately it has been captured. So how representative this model is of the uh, real natural building. So the model can be uploaded very easily using a very simple uh, form uh, that I think we are all used to uh, by now, a very simple um, one basically just uh, enters all the data and this data is later, as I said, uh, generated in an XML file which I think also is an added value um, so it's easy to create an XML file without having any other software, any other tool uh, that one would need um, and when a model is uploaded it doesn't uh, show uh, yet on the platform. It needs to be reviewed, reviewed. and it's reviewed by uh, our Arcturus team. So we review at the, if all the, the slots have been uh, filled in and also if the model is what it said uh, it is. So that it's not just a random, a random model of random thing. Um, and this is then, uh, we have this ability to communi communicate with the user and then the model is sent further if a person decides that uh, wants to publish this to Europa. It's not necessary though. So what we still are uh, wanting to develop in the, in the next phase, in the next projects is, of course, as I said, new measurements, uh, different the camera positions, uh, as I said, faster and better loading. Uh, and also enable uh, enabling uh, annotations. Annotations are now uh, available, uh, but only from the creator side, not from the user side. And I think this is uh, an additional, uh, not so not so technical challenge, but more uh, organizational challenges. Who will review these comments and so on? Yeah. Um, and of course, then the the idea of how to sustain this on the long term, how how to uh, launch it on the market at some point um, to ensure that, of course, the, 
models remain safely stored uh, there. Uh, and one of the ideas that we still want to explore is uh, connecting blockchain, so non-fungible tokens, as a source of ensuring that people who download this model uh, are respecting the, the, uh, the license that has been uh, ascribed to this model. Yeah, uh, you're invited to go to the website and try it yourself. Thank you, uh, Mateusz, uh, for the presentation and the video that worked. So we, see, we saw a bit of 3D models here, so it's good. Uh, any questions? Okay, so we move on to Rui, uh, who will say something about motion modes. Rui. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rui Rodrigues. Uh, I'm from Nova University in Lisbon and I'm here today to present this tool, the Motion Nodes uh, Annotation Tool. Um, so Motion Nodes is available under this URL. It's free for, for, for everyone to try it and create accounts and upload videos and add annotations. Um, our team uh, is Nuno Correia, Carla Fernandes, myself, uh, Stefan Jurgens, and John Yu. So, regarding the annotation tool, th this was the, start, the starting point in 2021. Uh, we developed further these uh, um, features that you can see here. It's possible, it was already possible to upload videos. To add uh, four types of annotations, it's possible to draw over the video, it's possible to add text messages, uh, short video clips, embed URLs in the videos, and also possible to add marks with a specific timestamp. Also, it's also possible to customize the annotations, the, the color of the annotations, the line thickness, the, the font type, um, and so on. Okay, also uh, the videos are um, under uh, the each user account, so the videos are private for each user to develop and to annotate. They only share the videos if they want to do it. Okay, so, so during this uh, WEAVE project, we proposed ourselves to develop two new main uh, features. The first one was to integrate 3D models into the annotation tool. And the second one was the integration of human pulse estimation. Okay, let's see this more. <coughs> uh, regarding the 3D features, we started by developing a way of import uh, 3D models into the motion nodes. It's also possible to manage these models, to delete them, to add new ones, and also to view the models. Uh, we developed a simple a viewer, uh, and uh, all the users can upload the models and then see the models, rotate them, and zoom in, zoom out, um, to check if everything is okay with the, the models. The models can be downloaded from Sketchfab or uh, can be created by the user himself and uploaded to the tool. And then the, the third uh, uh, item, it, it was all about the annotation, because this is an annotation tool. So we proposed ourselves to um, create this new type of annotation, to embed 3D models in videos, okay, to um, enlarge the information that a video can carry to the to the to the viewers to his viewers. So uh, we study. We have a case study here uh, that was published in ASEAN Digital Library. It was a case study that we did with our our, our partners Petchum from Portugal, Evra. Uh, they are specialists in Portuguese traditional dances and we had a workshop with them and we showed this kind of embed 3D models in videos and we worked with them the way that 
who they can recognize uh, the value of embed 3D models. So one use, use case that we worked on was um, in this Portuguese traditional dance called Rancho, where we can embed the 3D models um, that were used the, the, by the instruments that was were uh, used to create the melody that we are hearing. So the users can pause the video and can see all the details about the instruments. It's one way to enlarge this information that we can uh, have in our videos. Okay. So if you want to read a little bit more about the paper, just go to the digital library. It's available. <coughs> The second one was the human pose estimation. So, lots of our users um, are dancers, dancers and they teach dance and uh, the human movement is very important. It's a very important. Um, so, we integrated this, this uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithm called OpenPose. Uh, with OpenPose we can process the videos and have access to the uh, human bo bo body parts, all the human body parts, as we ca can see, the skeleton of the body parts. With those body parts it's possible to create dynamic annotations. What is dynamic annotations? Basically dynamic annotations are annotations that can follow the, the body part. If we create the annotation and associate the, the annotation with uh, a specific person arm, the annotation will follow the arm uh, in the video. So it is important to follow and to, to give and uh, make available a little bit more information with, by highlighting the specific body part with the annotation associated. Um, on your left side, side uh, the, the dance that we, we call pezinho in Portuguese, it, it's translated to English, little foot, <laughs> the dance is the little foot. Um, we managed to, to create a, the movement recognition, which is we, ha we have uh, information about the body parts and we process this body parts, the special uh, position of the body parts, we can identify automatically uh, certain types of movement. Here we developed uh, two of them, uh, which is it's possible to identify automatically when uh, people open the arms or open the legs. And uh, it's a simple movement, but it's good to, to have this information without people need to annotate uh, by hand. So automatically, and we are right now working to expand this movement identification and movement recognition with a specific uh, dance movements in Portuguese uh, of por Portuguese traditional uh, dances. So about the integration, uh, it's possible to download videos from Europeana and annotate the videos with motion notes. It's also possible to stream videos from European uh, if the rights, the privacy are okay, it's possible to do it. It's also uh, possible to embed uh, 3D models from our partners, R2. Uh, there is a direct connection between motion nodes and uh, 3D weaver. weaver. <laughs> Um, and also, if you uh, use videos in WeVex, it's possible to annotate videos from, uh, we stream these, these videos from WeVex. Um, it's also possible if the users want to, to share the, 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 their, work, their work, it's possible to embed uh, the annotation work in the blogs or websites or portals and so on with this functionality, embed code. Um, and uh, I invite you all to, to try this tool. It's available uh, under this URL. Also, uh, we had a presentation last week with more details about one hour presentation about these features. It's available in YouTube. 
our, under our with uh, channel. The direct link is here in this presentation. If you want to see more details about it, please go there and you are uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions to, to Ray regarding the motion notes? And the very interesting stuff that basically you do on rotating movement and parts of the video. Yes, please. Good, yeah, I was wondering if the, the, these motions of these traditional dances are extremely complex, right? These mm -hmm. patterns, even if they are patterns, I think that when it comes to them translating them into human motion, even for an algorithm, it must be extremely hard to, mm -hmm. to detect certain uh, recurring modes. So I was wondering, are you also training the algorithms with intentional sets of movements, intentional parts of choreography? Right now, we, we only start with the basics, with these basic movements, open arms, open legs, uh, arms up, arms down. We are only in the basics right now, but the objective is to work in the future, work a little bit more with this kind of movement. That is one movement that we discussed in that, in that workshop uh, with the Pechum. That was a movement that they do with the foot, something like this. Uh, and we are discussing the, the possibilities to identify this movement uh, automatically uh, we, and we are working right now in, the, in this kind of identification but it's only the, the start we are uh, trying to <coughs> meet with them uh, again because now the, 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 the tool is the development it's more it's we developed a little more on this side because when we met with them in December last year, we are mainly working in the 3D feature. Now we are working more in the, this kind of movements and we are uh, planning to have a list of uh, movements like this one mm -hmm. uh, to try to identify automatically and uh, yeah, have a list and uh, interface with in motion nodes to try to to <coughs> help the people to at least know the movements and, if possible, identify them automatically, yes. <laughs> so there's still a huge potential, but also a bit of uh, yeah, time challenge. The challenge. Get there. Yeah, 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 challenge. <laughs> Any other questions to me? Yes, Antonella, please. Uh, I'm, uh, thank you very much, because uh, the presentation was very clear uh, and uh, understandable also by the specialists. I'm wondering that if uh, this uh, AI applied to dance is uh, exploitable also for other videos where there are other kinds of movement. Because I think that this can be a high, can have a high potential in annotating videos. That is an area where uh, we still have uh, to develop uh, much mature uh, solutions. Yes. Are you considering that work? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, we, we are working with uh, some basketball coaches yes. as well uh, and we did some interviews with him and they already tried the tool. Uh, we had at least 10 interviews with basketball coaches and we, see, we saw the potential, they saw the potential on the tool and uh, they were also, I was talking about this movement that is specific for my dance, but they are speaking about the, the movement to, to throw the basketball uh, ball, uh, and we are identifying the the right angle. The right angle, identifying the right angle, it's a very important uh, thing, and uh, yeah, they are uh, very uh, interested in, in this tool. So, sports is is another. Uh, use case that we want to, <laughs> to I'm, I'm wondering that maybe also playing the music can have something and the music is an area that is not much developed in terms of uh, uh, developing the new techniques but learning how to play an instrument has to deal with the position of your hands your mm -hmm. Bones, your shoulders, your mouth, and so. 
Thank you. If I may add that this is for you know, personal interest, uh, also equitation is something that would really benefit this. But it, I'm fantasizing because here we are talking about not only movement of human body, but movement of a horse body. Yeah? That is a totally different uh, structure. And indeed, yeah, perhaps you would need a full bunch of other uh, projects to develop this. But certainly considering, especially in the professional world, you know, this is uh, an area where a lot of investment has, mm -hmm. is, is being uh, invested. Yeah. Uh, that is also something that, where I see potential. So, yes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the sky is the limit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Valentina. Please. three or four or five use cases that we already used the tool. Uh, the first one was with dances, uh, contemporary dance at first, and now traditional Portuguese dances. Uh, but also in sports, we are trying to use it, as I said before. But um, in the when we start developing the tool, um, some doctors, um, because uh, when they record the sur surgeries, they are recording the sur surgeries, and they want to annotate the, the, the surgeries for the interns to learn far faster. It's another uh, use case. Mm -hmm. Another one, it's uh, in the education. Uh, because I, I, I am a teacher, I record a, a lot of videos during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, when we returned to physical classes, I was trying to leverage that mater material. So I used motion nodes in my classes to teach progr web programming <laughs> and um, to add annotations and the, the, the students were adding an annotations. In the end of the class, we were uh, sharing the videos with everyone with the annotations so they can study. So we are basically commenting the program lines, the lines of codes <laughs> with, annotation to, with this annotation tool. This is another use case. And Probably there is another, another one that I am not remember right now, but yeah, there is a lot of use cases. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Rui. Um, well, there are certainly many use cases, and I would say the most, um, let's say, immediate uh, one is sports. Uh, we had projects in sports, and this is uh, useful. Any other questions? So then we move on to Orfeas from Think Code. Yep. We're going to present this metadata enrichment and ingestion yep. tools. I don't know, is this working? Good. Well, hello everyone, I'm Orfeas, and I'm here to present the metadata enrichment tools that we used uh, within the Weave project. And let me start with a platform that we used, it's Sage. I know many of you have already heard about it. I'll try to keep it short. Basically, we have developed a platform that can basically integrate data from different sources and of various formats. So, for example, if you're an institution or an organization and you have your metadata in your own database, <coughs> you can use Sage to transform all these into RDF and create a uniform representation of your data. We can harvest data from your databases, you can actively push data, so it doesn't mind where you keep your data or in which form, we can integrate it into one platform and in that way, you can clean and you can create a uniform representation. Then, you can use the platform to enrich the metadata. And we will see now what we mean by enriching. And you can have like a clear overview of, the, of your data. Now, what do we mean when we say metadata enrichment? 
We want basically to create links between our objects and external knowledge bases. We want basically to create, as we say here, fully fledged resources. So we don't just need strings, but we need a link to the respective entity in another database. For example, you may have uh, some metadata that the creator is mentioned or the place of creation. This doesn't really mean as a string something, but if you link it to the Wikidata page, you can have access to other, uh, let's say, works of this creator. You can have access to other works that were created in that place. You can have unlimited potential to access the knowledge. So once you create, I mean, you make your data link data, you can have access to all the other resources. So that's the main purpose of this. And this can help like in indexing, in searching, in many other cases. We'll see the two basic tools that we used in Weave. First, we have the Nerd Annotator, as I said. Basically, it performs named entity recognition and disambiguation. What this is, is that you have a text, and then the tool itself finds the named entities. Named entities can be persons, place names, organizations, institutions. And then, after it finds some potential named entities, it tries to disambiguate to find the proper, let's say, entities in a knowledge base. Our tool works with uh, Wikidata. We will also see like an example. The, the core be between, uh, behind sorry, this tool is basically NLP techniques. It's AI based. I will not get too technical. I don't think it matters now. But let's see an example to better understand what it does. Let's say we have a description of an object. Here we have basically a description of uh, Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. So the tool first finds that there are some potential entities. We see that they are identified like uh, Nighthawks, Edward Hopper, the School of uh, Art Institute of Chicago. So the tool itself just takes the text, it finds these terms, and is able to disambiguate and find the respective Wikidata entities. We saw that it found the painting itself, it found the creator, and it also found the place where it is displayed. So after that, we can either harvest additional information and add it to our record to keep it in our databases, or we can just create links, and then we can use these links to add information, to just provide some relevant uh, entities to our users, anything we want. The other tool is basically a link data annotator. What this means is that, in this case, we don't leave the tool in the wild to search in the Wikidata. We give, let's say, a small vocabulary, a curated thesaurus if you want, whatever you need. And then the, the tool performs some smart string matching, which means that it doesn't have to find the exact term that is the label of our vocabulary, but it can find also some alternatives. And then we have also provided with the label of the source, also URI, and it links our entity to that. This basically has also a big advantage compared to the previous one, that behind, uh, besides control, which is a big issue, because if you let just a nerd tool to perform, it can find things that you don't consider useful. It's also much, much, much faster. So with this tool, we, uh, we were able to annotate millions of records in previous projects, which is something that we wouldn't be able to do with the other annotator because it would take like around two years, I think, something like that. And uh, we can see an example here that uh, we have, again, a description. We have a thesaurus that is basically some materials and some colors. We have done this with some fashion items before. And uh, you can see that the tool is able to identify from the description of the entity something about this material that is made of like metal and some about these colors with the blue and yellow. And you can see that it doesn't have to find the exact word blue. You can understand like that bluish is just another word that we can use like in the color spectrum of blue. And because all these are made automatically, you need to have some control over the enrichments. You can't just use the enrichments as they are because in some cases, as you can imagine, there are some enrichments that are not useful, they're wrong, there might be better options. So in our platform, we have created, let's say, a human the loop approach so that we can validate. And we're currently experimenting of retraining some tools. So there are human validators that, uh, depending on the amount of enrichments, can, I, can either uh, validate all the enrichments or a sample of them. Like in Weave, we validated 100% of the enrichments because it were like some thousands and it was possible. 
Uh, of course, we have optimized some searches so that you don't have to validate the same things again to if different uh, records have the same lexical, let's say, you only validate once. Uh, but still, it's some manual work that needs to be done. And uh, after this validation, the users basically have a single job, accept or reject an enrichment. And they have the option to propose, let's say, an alternative option if they find a better one. After that, we are now trying to create also a statistical analysis because in some cases you have so many enrichments that we not validate all of them. So you need to generalize the observations. Uh, so we try to analyze the results of the validation along with the validators. So we leave them, uh, they leave comments and we discuss with them so that we can generalize their observations and apply improvements to all the enrichments. So let's say if they found that generally R2 linked this name with this entity, but they found a better one, we can apply this uh, change, let's say, to all the enrichments. And we have like some exportation filters that you can filter like the levels because each tool, let's say, has also uh, confidence. So it says that I found this, but in some cases it's not very sure, so it, go, it gives you low confidence. After the validation, we can see that mm, the validators rejected all the enrichments below this confidence. So maybe we should follow this and reject all the enrichments with low confidence. In other cases, uh, the user might find it useful to have all the enrichments. They didn't care if it was low or high confidence. So that it's also up to the user and it's modular, let's say. Uh, Sage is fully integrated with Europeana. You can uh, now basically harvest from Europeana directly, if your data are already there. Uh, we just created also a direct integration through Mint, which is basically an ingestion tool. Some of you, I think, already know. And uh, you can also directly harvest from there. And as we said, it's also up to you. You may have your own database and we can harvest from there the data. And after the enrichment, after cleaning, validating, etc., you can just decide which enrichments you want to be integrated into your own data. And through Mint, they can be published back to Europeana, which is basically the workflow that we also used in Weave. Some numbers about what we did in Weave. As we can see, we have like a bit over 9.5 thousand enrichments in uh, 3.8 thousand records. Uh, 10 us uh, users were involved, either from our part, some experts that did the enrichments, either some partners that uh, did the validation, and we thank them very much. Also, I forgot to mention that for the link data annotator, we created a custom vocabulary, and some people here worked really hard for that, and thank you. Valentina especially directed, let's say, the whole procedure. And uh, a good thing that we noticed is that uh, from the validation, 91.2 of the reasons were accepted, which means that the tools actually did a good job. Now we have some future improvements that we're currently working on. We want to add more uh, annotators, let's say, more ways to enrich your data. Maybe we're uh, experimenting with some topic analysis tools and some other things. Uh, something very important is that we want to create a complete validation framework and add some other extensions to the tool so that uh, instead of only accepting or rejecting annotation, it's very important to indicate the best target field for that. Because we might find an enrichment in the description, but we don't know if it's the creator, if it's just a place, if it's just an institution mentioned, we don't know. And we're currently in discussion with Europeana and we have already prepared some new changes. I think within the next month we will release the next version of the tool. And the other big change we want to make is to make the platform more simple so that an end user could use. Because right now the workflow is that you come to us, we take the data, we enrich them and we give it back to you. We want to make it as, as simple as possible so that you can also do it yourselves. And that's it. Thank you. Thank questions you, first? thank you very much, Fias, for the presentation and you know impressive accuracy. I would say ninety-one percent. That's <laughs> great. So, any questions, please? No questions here. Maybe a comment uh, in the framework of we. Is that yes? In the framework of we, we were extremely careful with this validation of the enrichment. And what we really wanted to do is to involve the content providers, so the institutions who host the source data, 
to check that what the machine added is compliant. Eh? And this is, we think it was uh, super important. And also, in the case of WIB, where we work also with content from local communities, we involved the communities themselves to you know, support this validation process. So indeed, I can say that the acceptance rate is very high. This means that the tool works, but it also means that the review worked because the human in the loop was able to find the things that the machine didn't do properly and to you know, train the machine uh, back, so for uh, uh, even more improvement of these tools. Because indeed, in the case of WIF, the amount of items is limited, but we are talking about artificial intelligence, which is able to work on millions and millions of records. And in that case, as you say, the human part cannot be on everything, and the validation must be on a percentage of, uh, of records. So, yeah, we really think that this part of the validation needs to be uh, curated by the those who have a stake in the cultural heritage that is uh, represented in the data. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, there is a question here from John. Uh, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment, which is I was about to validate everything that content we put it in. And, and to start with, we were sort of thinking, oh, you know, how are we going to get through this task of doing however many thousand validations or whatever? But it, it proved to be very simple and it's very user friendly. It's just tick across and, you know, as you went down. Um, I guess. The errors it made, it was quite common errors. So, you know, we had a lot of content with a lot of similar sort of words in it, and we'd constantly get the, the thing wrong, but I'm assuming it's learning from that. Um, and then I, the other thing would maybe would be uh, to improve it is that you can obviously see place names or people that it didn't pick up that maybe it should have. So, I don't know how there was a, you know, if there's an ability to sort of flag those up and say you should have should have found something to this, you know, because the human like in us isn't going to make the effort to to annotate every single one, like to, to link every single one into Wikidata or whatever it is. So if the machine picks them up or can instantly look at those from clicking on them, that would be even easier to do, I think. So but I was quite impressed from from a starting point of, oh, what are we gonna do? And then to do it. I think it was well done. Yeah, thanks, and it's a valid point. Sorry, if you want that. Yeah. That it's something that we haven't considered. We allow the user to add an annotation to the whole record, but as you say, they might miss like many points, and it would be used either for retraining or for using a more specialized enricher. Let's say so we can say search for these exact words, and maybe you can find. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, when we started, it was very we had sort of big subject things, so we could add, add bulk to all of that. So we did very basic, you know, only three or four wiki data to chunks. Mm -hmm. And then this did the detail. And but I think we could have done more details or we could have suggested that more details if there was an I think this is a very good idea basically because it, then it will improve the recall so that basically you got all this, uh, the things that you have basically missed. Because you don't know if you only validate a couple of items, you don't know what you have basically missed. And uh, Human in Loop can, uh, can uh, support that, uh, this thing. Uh, David, please. Yes, hi, yes. Uh, we don't know if you are to the project, but it's still extremely useful and effective for people working with metadata. So my question is, are there possibilities for people who are not partners or who are not in the European environment to use this tool? Yes. Will it be accessible? Or yes, of course. As I said, the tool currently is a bit complex, so you basically contact us and we, create, we discuss how we will perform the enrichment. The project is also open source, but I wouldn't suggest setting on your own. It's a mess, you know. I can barely use it sometimes, you know. No, I'm kidding. But the, the basic workflow now is that you can contact us. It doesn't matter if you are in European or something. We can also integrate data from other sources. And we can discuss, like, on the type of enrichments that you want, as since we're also currently you know, experimenting with different types of enrichments, we can also consider your, let's say, preferences to better, like, specialize our tools. So yeah, it's open to use for everyone, and they can just contact us and see, you know, how we can make, like, the best fit for the needs of the user. 